We read in this week's parsha of Lech Lecha, uh, how Avram was told by God to leave his land, his birthplace, and his family, and to go to the land which he will be shown. The Ramban over here makes an interesting point. There's no history of Avram's status as a tzaddik, as anything special until this point. As it says by Noah, I see you to be the tzaddik in the generation and therefore go build the teva. We speak about Avram and Terach and uh, the kiln of Kazdim is alluded to, referred to Ur Kazdim. And then all of a sudden, Hashem says to Avram, leave the land and so on and so forth. Why? Why is the Torah being so uh, inconspicuous here? And literally not being very explicit about exactly what the relationship is. And even explain why should he leave his land? Why should he leave his land? So the Ramban says in the Surah, Leave your land, and I will do good with you, and it's a level of goodness. There's nothing ever comparable to it in the history of existence. You'll have renown. You'll become a, a nation. You'll have wealth. Why? without predicating on because Avram served God who he was this perfect tzaddik or to explain the reason why he should go to that location that he should get closer to God so he explains the Ramban he says the, the members of the community were Kazdim. They were evil in their behavior. They were pagans. And they disgraced and they ridiculed Avram. And he says, just as you find by the generation of the Haflogo, of the dispersion, the Torah doesn't want to speak about the details of what their beliefs were their idolatry, what it was, because it's something which represents something which is the Torah doesn't want to expli explicitly, so it just alludes to some things. Similarly here, the Torah doesn't want, only alludes to the Kazdim, to the kiln of Kazdim that he was thrown into it, rather than getting into details what it was and how he was persecuted and how he's a pariah and so on and so forth. All the various debates and disagreements that Avram had in theology with the members of that community. The Torah doesn't want to discuss it. Therefore, the Torah doesn't really address it, and it begins with the Lech Lecho. Okay? It's interesting. We read in Pirkei Ovos that there were 10 generations from Odom to Noah. And they were all, they enraged God, they angered God, and God was patient with them, with them until it reached a point, he destroyed, destroyed them with the great flood. And then there were 10 generations from Noah to, Odom, to Avram, and again, similar behavior, identical behavior, they angered him, and God was Erech Apayim, he, he had patience with them, and then it concludes, and Avram Kibel Schar Kulam. Avram received reward, the equivalent of all ten generations. He didn't destroy them. So Rabbi Yona in his commentary on Pirkei Ovis explains that it's only worthwhile for God to keep the world going if there's a balance of good versus evil. Noah, his mission was to bring the people back 
to do tshuva, to, to repent, he failed. Did not succeed. But factually, if he didn't succeed, the world itself was off balance. Evil was so weighty on everything, and Noah, in his own right, was not able to compensate for the lack, for the void, for the vacuum that was created through this evil. So because he couldn't compensate, therefore God had to destroy the world. Because of the evil, which was overwhelming, leaned greater than whatever Noah was. Avram was so special that all the pe- though, though the people failed, he was able to compensate for what they were meant to do. To bring about all the good that they were meant to do. He, he created that good. Therefore, he was kibbal schar kenegat kulam. Therefore, he received reward for the equivalent of all the generations. That's why God did not destroy the world. For that reason. Because the world, the balance, was sufficiently to the good because of what Avram accomplished. Now, seemingly there's a question. After the great flood, Hashem made a covenant with existence that it will never again destroy the world with water. Why? Because man is inclined to, to evil. And what is the sign of the covenant? The rainbow. So whenever you see the rainbow, that tells us the world, as at a point, they deserve to be destroyed. But he's not destroying them because of the covenant. But yet we find by Avram, if he wouldn't have compensated for their evil by generating a level of good that they were meant to do, he would have destroyed the world. How would he have destroyed the world? God made a covenant, he's not going to destroy the world. So what are you going to say? He's not going to destroy the world with water, but he will destroy the world. But it seems to be, but if the reason is because man is inclined to do evil, and they were evil, and what do we need? It seems to be, it's only because Avram compensated for what they were meant to do, but it seems that if they wouldn't have, he would have destroyed them. But man is inclined to do evil. Why would he destroy the, why would he destroy the world? If Avram wouldn't have compensated for what, and taken up the slack, he would have destroyed the world. But what about the reality? Man is inclined to do evil. Even if he wouldn't have, God said he wouldn't destroy the world. What difference does it make? Water or any other way? We find that Sinai, Hashem put a mountain over our heads. And he said to us, either you accept my Torah, if not the two versions in Chazal, you'll be buried under the mountain, or the world will revert back to pre-existence. The world will revert back to Tov Avo, this, this chaotic state of non-existence. That means God will destroy the world. If the Jews don't accept Torah, He will destroy the world. But God said He wouldn't destroy the world. So how do we reconcile it? The same question as Avram. Now, why did God create existence? As it says, it's alluded to in the first Pesach, Breshis Bore Lokimei Sishmai Vesoretz. For the sake of Torah, God created this world. This is the setting, as it says, Stak over Isubari Alma. The blueprint for existence is the Torah. The testing grounds is existence. That's where man is tested. Do you succeed or do you fail? Torah. Which people have relevance to the Torah? Only Klal Yisrael have relevance to the Torah. Bishul Yisrael Shnikoratius. So that that God will destroy the world if we reject the Torah, it's not punishment. It's because the objective of purpose cannot be addressed, cannot be met. If the purpose of existence of creation is only Torah and the people who have relevance to Torah, and the people who have relevance to Torah, they reject it, so what's the point? There's no point going further. Of course, creation was only for the sake of Torah. And if there's no people who could live by the Torah because they reject it, if that's the case, God ends existence. Not as a punishment, as it had no longer has value. Avram Avinu, if he wouldn't have taken up the slack, what would have been? Now what happened? It says, Avram. Avram was tested with 10 tests. That was part of his perfection. He took up the slack for the 10 generations. 
part of that of generating good was the ten tests. Why is Avram the founding father of the Jewish people? Because he he actually was able to withstand the ten tests. If he would have been able to stand withstand the ten tests, he wouldn't have been the founding patriarch of Klal Yisrael. If that's the case, so if Avram is not the founding patriarch of Klal Yisrael of the Jewish people, there is no Jewish people. So again, if there's no Jewish people, why is God ending the world? Not as a punishment. Again, because the existence value is only for Torah. And Torah only only has relevance if there's a Klal Yisrael. If there's no Jewish people, there's no, there's no purpose in existence. So it's not as a punishment. That that he destroyed the ten generations from Odom to Noach is because that was a punishment. They were evil. That's why he destroyed them. It's not because existence didn't have value. It'll have value in the future. But now that we're coming to Avram Avinu, and he is supposed to be the founding father of Klal Yisrael, and if he should fail, that means if he fails, that means he's not worthy to be the founding father. So if that's the case, where does it go? It goes nowhere. It goes nowhere. God ends, ends existence. There's no longer existence. There's no purpose in existence. It says, therefore, it's not contradictory. As punishment, man is evil. God will not des- destroy the world because of man's evilness. But God will end existence if existence no longer has value. Because its value is Torah and that there should be a Klal Yisrael. And if there's not going to be a Klal Yisrael, then it has no value because there's no people who are at a level who could live within the guidelines and conform to Torah itself. There's a Gemara. The Gemara tells us <coughs> that Mordechai who together with Esther wrote about galvanized the people to fast, to do tshuva and there was a miracle was not, was not a revealed miracle it was concealed within nature they, we destroyed our enemies rather than enemies destroying us we had the upper hand and Esther revealed to Ahasuerus, her husband, the king, who was Mordechai. He was her uncle. He was appointed to become the viceroy. He became the viceroy of the Persian Empire. After he became the viceroy of the Persian Empire, the Megillah tells us he was Rotsui he Lerovechov. Was, he was only accepted by the majority of his colleagues, of his peers. Before he became viceroy, he was Rotsi Lecholechov. He was accepted by all his peers. Afterwards, because he became viceroy and he wasn't able to study as much because he was preoccupied with his responsibility as viceroy, he was only accepted and valued by the majority of his colleagues. But there was a minority who rejected him because he wasn't involved as he was involved before. So the Gemara draws from this, but you say, how could you have a claim against him? It's pikuach nefesh. What was at stake? The survival of the Jewish people. There was a decree, not a single Jew would have been left. So if that's the case, why was he rejected by a minority of his colleagues? It was only the Rov Echod, but there was a minority who rejected him. So the Gemara tells us, we see from here, the Gedola Talmud Torah, Yosem Hatzolos Nefoshos, that the study of Torah has greater value than saving a life, saving Klal Yisrael. If the cost factor is that you don't study Torah, then it wasn't worthwhile. It's only because, and we see it because otherwise it's unjustified. He saved. He saved the day. So from here we learn that Gedola Talmud Torah greater is the study of Torah than saving a life. How do we understand it? We know that the Torah tells us that if there's ever a question of human Jewish life or the Torah itself, Jewish life supersedes Shabbos, Yom Kippur, anything except for the three cardinal sins. It supersedes it. So why was he rejected by a minority of his peers? Now, you should live by my Torah and not die as a result of my Torah. Therefore, human life, Jewish life supersedes the Torah. Now, 
But why does the Torah want you to live? What is the value of Jewish life? You know what the value of Jewish life is? To study the Torah. That is its value. But if the ultimate end is that there is no Torah, what's the value? The reason why you supersede the Shabbos Yom Kippur, because if you live, you can fulfill the Torah. If you die, you can't. So therefore, human life, Jewish life has greater value. But if at the end of the day, after I save you, there is no Torah, because you had to assume duties which doesn't allow you to study, then you failed. Then there's a negative end, ending over here. Therefore, he was rejected by a minority of his colleagues for that reason. Again, what's the objective of creation? If, God forbid, if there would be no people studying Torah, God says, existence has no value. There's a famous word from Chaim Velozhino, Nefesh Chaim. If there should be one moment that there's no Jew anywhere in existence studying Torah, the world would instantaneously revert back to pre-creation. Why? Because it says in the Pasuk, the Navi says, Im lo brisi yom If my bris, if my covenant, which is Torah, is not in effect day and night, unceasingly, minimally, there has to be one Jew studying Torah, chukol shemai vorts lo samti. The extent of heaven and earth I would not leave in place. Because again, what is the objective? The objective of God willing existence and bringing into existence as Torah should be studied. But if Torah will not be studied, not even by a solitary Jew, God says, I have no interest in this existence whatsoever. We find, the Mishnah tells us in Pirkei Ovos, that kol alomet Torah mitoch a person who studies Torah as a result of being impoverished, mitoch oni, as a result, within the context of impoverishment, he studies Torah Osher. God ultimately will provide wealth to make it easier for him. And Torah Osher, a person who has not studied Torah in a context of wealth, so for the God says, you're going to waste your time in an impoverished state. What's the rationale? Why does God endow a person with wealth? To make life easier for him. Easier for what? That you should have less distraction to study Torah, to focus on Torah. But if you mevatl bitoch osher, if you don't study it, despite the fact that I'm giving you all this wealth, so God says, I'm wasting my time. If that's the case, I would withdraw the wealth. But the person who shows his dedication to God despite impoverishment, despite the difficulty, He's still committed to the study of Torah. God says, ultimately, I will make it easy for you. You're going to study Torah I always give an example. Allegory. This person wants to create a fund. And this person was a rainmaker. And making money for people. Tremendous returns on their investments. And people, and he doesn't take less than a $10 million investment. And he put together a tremendous amount of money and she tells his investors you know before I start with the fund I have to really travel around the world have to vacation I should really be in a relaxed state okay so he knew in advance so the first six months the fund's not going to make any money and it'll come down because he has to cover his traveling expenses and whatever whatever the cost is six months later he sets up an office meets with all kinds of interior decorators, only the best furniture, the best furnishings, okay? A year has passed, the investors call, uh, so how is our investment doing? Well, you realize it's down about 5% because just the cost of the travel and the office and this, I haven't had time. What else, okay, another few months passed, how's it doing? I had some other thing, you know, I had to speak to my therapist and I had to be busy with something else. The people start realizing, you know, something. They say to him, Leo, if you'd be involved in our investment, in our enterprise, we'd give you all the money you want. We'd leave the money, even add money. But it seems to be, you're not in it for us, you're in it for yourself. If that's the case, we're pulling the money. God says, I have an unlimited amount of capital. I could give you everything and beyond everything. But that's if you're working on my project. <laughs> you're working on your project, I, I pulled the money. They have a call, Allah made me toch. 
Only you study Torah despite the impoverishment, you're going to study it in a state of wealth. But the person is a bevatl Torah, mitoch osher. You have wealth and you waste God's time with it. God says, you know something? Don't waste my time. You're going to study, you're going to waste your time in a state of impoverishment for that reason. But again, because again, what's the objective? The objective is Torah itself. If you don't total line as God wants you to total line, God says, you know something? Existence no longer has value to me. Therefore, you have to have minimally one Jew to study somewhere in existence, but if you don't even have that, existence doesn't, but it's not as a punishment. Because the purpose is that, and if that purpose is not addressed, it has no value whatsoever. Hashem says to Avram, if you go to the land, leave your homeland, go to the land I will show you, the Eschol Godel, I will make you into a great nation. Agad lo shmecho, I will make your name great. So seemingly, it would seem to mean, I will give you renown. Here you're a pariah, you're hounded, you're despised, you're persecuted, you're discriminated. You go there, you will have renown. Seems to be a little difficult. I mean, when Chazal go and they list the three most humble people who ever lived, who was the most humble person who ever lived? Moshe Rabbeinu, which the Torah tests that. The second most humble person was Avram. He said, Anochi Ofer What am I? I'm dust, I'm ash. David says, Anochi I'm a worm. I'm not a person. A man who's so humble. He's running away from the limelight. I will give you renown. And what's the value of the renown? He's, he's, he's humble. He's an honor. Why is that something? Why is that an incentive? Why does that incentivize him? And what, what are they? All the others, Agadoshim, they had tremendous wealth. What was the value of the wealth? Avram, you say he needed wealth. He had a hospitality center going 24 hours a day. And it's, the Gemara tells us that the banquet of, of Shlomo Melch at the height of his power was not the equivalent of what Avram fed his guests. That was the, that was the dimension of hosting. He made a tremendous amount of money for this, okay? And what about renown? Renown, it's not for himself. If a person has renown, automatically people are attracted to you. You don't have to establish your credibility. If that's the case, you become a magnet. You become a, a magnet for what? For being the representation of God's presence in this world. So Avramovic, this was everything. It had nothing, it's not to give him honor, honor for him. By him being, having renown, therefore he becomes an effective person, a more effective person. That was the value of the renown. But Rashi cites the Bidjish. Agad Lashmecha means, Rashi says, Hareini Mosef Osal Shmecho. His name was Avrom. I will add a letter to your name. Your name will become a larger name. Shar Achshov Shibch Avrom. Mikan Ve'elech Avrohom. He became Avrohom. Avrom Ole Ramach. Avrom numerically is Ramach, 248. Keneged Evor Shalodom, which corresponds to the parts of a person. Ramach. That's Agad Shmecho. Therefore, what? You become Ramach. We read later that when Avram was circumcised, right? Hashem says to Avram, If you do this, you become Tomim, you become whole. So Rashi cites Chazal that until he was circumcised, there were five parts of his body that he did not have full control over. His eyes, his ears, and his male organ. Once he removed the foreskin, which is the circumcision, which is the milah, he became Rabach, he became Avrom. He was in full, total do dominance over every aspect of his physicality. So that's Ramach. 
Avram is Ramach. You become that spiritual person. Mitzvah Saseh, right? The 248 positive commandments. That's what the Ramach correspond to. But it's interesting. There's a corresponding factor. We have 248 commandments corresponding to the 248 parts of the Jew. Before he was circumcised, he was not Ramach. He was 243. Then he became 245. But factually, the 248 mitzvahs I say, positive commandments. The answer is, it's not appropriate. That means the mitzvahs that are meant to spiritualize every aspect of the Jew's, Jew's being, his physical being. But what about he, part of his being is a be, is, is, represents something which cannot be influenced or impacted with Kedusha, with holiness? You're not there. You don't make the grade. It's only once the Jew is in a, in a state where every aspect of his being could be sanctified, now you're ready. Now you're ready to assume the Ramach, the 248 mitzvahs I say, positive commandments. Okay? Now, it's interesting. There's a maral, which we once mentioned. We have Shasa mitzvahs lo sasei. You have 365 negative commandments. You have 248 positive commandments. Now, Chazal tells us, the Benjish tells us, Shasa mitzis lo sase keneged The 365 negative commandments correspond to the solar year. And Ramach Mitzvah Saseh, the 248 positive commandments correspond to the parts of the human body. So the Maral explains when Chazal tell you that 365 corresponds to the solar calendar, it's not a mnemonic. It's much more than that. Now, what is 365 versus the solar calendar? That means the rotation of the earth when it rotates on its axis it does a full rotation over a 365 day period, okay? So for the world to function in its order, what's order within physical existence? That the world exists, in what context of order? 365 is, represents order. For the Jew to retain the order of his spirituality, that his spirituality should be in order, he must observe 365 negative commandments. So it's the same thing. Just as the rotation is order, so what is the rotation, what is the order of the Jew's spirituality? That it, it should not be diminished and it should function properly. You have to observe 365 negative commandments. What is the difference between a negative commandment and a positive commandment? When you tell somebody, don't do that, what is the connotation? It's not in your best interest to do that. It'll hurt you, it will diminish you. It's a diminishment. So we have 365 negative commandments. So if you don't cross those lines, what are you doing? You're retaining the spirituality, your soul remains intact as it was given to you. If you violate any one of the 365, the order has been impaired. It's been altered. The order, it doesn't function the way it should function. It's no longer functioned within the order, which is 365. Because you crossed the line, you did something which has a negative consequence, it's a detriment to you, okay? What's mitzvah say? When you say something, do this, it's good for you. Do is, is something good, it's beneficial. Mitzvah Saseh is a concept of advancement, growth, spiritual growth. The negative is non-diminishment. The positive commandment is advancement, spiritual advancement. Do this, study Torah, say Shema, wear tefillin, matzah, sukkah, lulav, observe Shabbos, Yom Tif, do it, it's good, it's beneficial. That's all advancement, okay? So Maral explains 
What's the difference between a Jew and a non-Jew's obligation? A non-Jew has Shev Mitzvah B'nai Noach. Every one of the seven Noahite laws are negative commandments except for dinim, except for establishing a judicial system. Which means a non-Jew, his obligation vis-a-vis -vis God is God says, after you finish the years you live in this world, just give me back your soul as I gave it to you. Not diminished. Me, you didn't cross those lines. But dinim, laws, judicial says that's positive. That's only to guarantee that the negative is not, is not transgressed. Its value is the negative for the sake of the negative. A Jew is retained the order, 365 negative, and not to d diminish it and also to advance. 248 in positive commandments is an indication of advancement. You advance. Now, why is the human being called Adam? Why was he called Adam? Because he was made of earth. Adama. That's why he was called Adam. So the question is, the animal was also made of earth. The domesticated on the domesticated was made of earth also. But that they're called Behema and Chaya. They're not called Adam. So what so the morale says, Odom, what is earth? Earth represents potential. You leave it fallow, it's just a clump of earth, regardless of its quality. You cultivate it, all life unceasingly grows from earth. That's what Odom is. Odom means you're a being of potential, that's growth. Atem kruim Odom, him lo kruim Odom. After Adam was created, and he was disenfranchised because the eight of dates are thus, Hashem says, now you've assumed the role of Adam. You have relevance to that. No other nation has relevance to that growth, the potential of spiritual growth. The non-Jew, it's a seven Noahide laws, which are negative commandments, which is just to maintain your level of spirituality. There's no advancement. That's, we are the Adam. We, ha we have that potential as earth. So when Avram Avinu was told, Agad l'shmecho, I will add a hey to your name to be Ramach. What did that say to Avram? He's not a Noahide any longer. When he became Avram, now the spiritual growth, he has relative to spiritual growth, which wasn't the case before. Before, he was only to maintain your essence. Now that you have Ramach, which alludes that you have, which corresponds to Ramach Mitzvah say, 248 positive commandments, he understands it's a different being. It's a different reality. My soul is a different soul. It doesn't have the limitation of it remains entombed in what it is. And the only direction it could take is a downward direction rather than advance to, to, to elevate itself. That's Agad Shmecho. That's interesting. When did Avram become Avram? When he was circumcised. When he was told, when he's, he says, now you, when you're circumcised, you become, I will add a hate to your name to be Avram. The Rechaim HaKadosh writes in Pashat Tazria that Odom, when he was created, he was created without a foreskin. When he ate the, of the Eitzah Das, which is good and evil, the evil expressed itself with the foreskin which covered the male organ. The Jew was given the mitzvah of Milo because by cutting off that foreskin, although we're still tainted with the, with the Eitz Adas to a degree, but it minimizes the effect of the negative effect of the, of the Rav Eitz Adas. So it comes out, it's beautiful. When did he have the hay added to his name? When did he become, have relevance to be the Odom? Odom is advancement, Ramach, when that foreskin removed. By removing that, that minimized the negative effect of the Eitz now you have relative to spiritual growth. Not that Avram was still classified as a Noahide. We only became Odom at Sinai. That's when we became Odom. But he, he was the founding father, which represents Ramach 248, because ultimately we will be obligated in 248 Mitzvah We find in this week's parsha, it says, 
עקב אשר שמע אברום בקולי, תורוסאי, all things. It says that אברום אבינו kept the Torah its entirety. The written Torah, the oral Torah, all the fences of the Torah. Everything. What, what is it all about? What relevance does he have to it? Because Avram Avinu understood that all these things are all advanced with mitzvahs. It's not only the negative. He kept the positive commandments. Because Avram Avinu understood that he was ultimately endowed with an ability to father the nation that's going to have relevance to all that. So although he was an enum mitzvosa, it was on a non-obligatory obligation level. But ultimately it will be obligatory. Every one of those mitzvahs that he kept He'd be obligated to do them. There's a midrash that tells us, based on the Gemara, when Hashem created the world, which letters, we discussed it the other week, did Hashem, the spiritual within, which letters did God create the world? So the Gemara tells us that with the letters Yud and He, He created the world to come, and the He, the physical world. Because Dover Mel says in Tilim, Hashem Lomim. With Yud K, the name of Hashem, Yud K, He created the worlds. The spiritual world with the spirituality of the letter Yud, and the physical world with the spirituality of the letter He. So all existence came about through what? Through the letter He. Hashem says to Avram, Avram says to God, what's the good of all the blessing? I'm not going to have a child because it says in the stars, Avram ain't lo ben. Avram has no child, he says. Maybe Avram ain't lo ben, Avraham yesh lo ben. When I add the hey, you will have a child. You'll be able to father a child. Why? So it's, what is it, just a tag? I'm just going to put a, just a new nameplate on you. What is it? So Hashem says to Avram, what it took to create all existence, the spirituality of the hey, brought about all existence, for you to be able to father a child, all that energy that brought about all existence, which is borders on infinite, that's needed to change your context to be able to father that child. So although in the physical sense he was the same person, but in terms of the innateness of his value of representation, he was the equivalent of all existence. That's what Avram was. That's the hey. That's what the hey did for him. So therefore, what is Avram? And it's explicit in, in the, another midrash. He's Bria Chadosha. He's the equivalent of ex nilo. What Avram became, nothing pre-existed his existence. And therefore, the person before could have a father Yishmael. But the father Yitzchak, which is the eternal people, which kol amatzel nefesh achos Yisrael, if you save one Jew, you save the whole world. What do you mean save the whole world? The answer is the spirituality of the Jew. How did that come about? The spirituality of the nations, the non-Jew is not the spirituality of the Jew. This, what was needed to bring about all existence, including all the souls of the non-Jew, that's what we needed to create the Jewish soul. The innateness of the Jew. So therefore, if you save one Jewish life, it's like saving a whole world. Of course, the Jews' value to bring them about is the equivalent of bringing about a whole world. That's the understanding. The Midrash tells us, it says in the, in the, in the Pasuk, the Escho Lugar Godel. What does the word Escho mean? I will make you. It doesn't say, Asimcho Lugar Godel. Nidra says, the Escho Enksiv Asimcho. It doesn't say, I will allow you to evolve into a great nation. I will make you a great nation. Omalo, Oscho Ani Bore Bria Chadosha. Words of the Midrash. I will create you into a new being. What's creation? It's not Yitzir, Yitzir is formation. Bria is ex nilo. What I create did not exist prior to this moment. King Shnema Vayasil Kimas Arakia, as says, God made the heaven, made the sky. Vayas Elokim Eshneham Oros, before he made them, they didn't exist. The two luminaries.
Omer Pinchas Hakoyim Bar Choma Imosai Osa Kodesh Baruch Hu Es Avrom Lugoy Godel. When did Avrom become that great nation? This is Ve'Escho Mishikibli Yisrael Es Torah. When the Jews received the Torah at Sinai, she came Moshe Omelam Migoy Godel. That's when we became the Goy Godel. What does that mean? When did we become the Odom? When did the, the, the actual transformation that we went from Ben Noach to Yisrael? When did that happen? That happened at Sinai. And therefore then we became the Ramach people. That's Ramach. Ramach has relevance to every aspect of our physicality has relevance to a mitzvah. Corresponding to 248 positive commandments. That's what we're talking about spiritual growth. But you were a Noahide. The answer is that who, the person who was Noahide was not me. That's a different being. I'm a different being today. I'm a Bria Chadosha. It's a new creation. That's what I am. The Mishnah tells us in Pirkei Ovos that Avram was tested in, with 10 tests. Which was the first of the 10? So seemingly, or Kazdim. He was given an, an ultimatum. Either you bow to the idol or you go into the kiln. He chose to go into the kiln. Okay? But from the Midrash, you see, the Midrash disagrees. The first test was Lech Lecho. Lech Lecho was the first test. It says... Rav Levi Omer, Nisoyin Horishon, Kidisoyin Achron. The first test was similar to the last test. Nisoyin Horishon, Belech Lechomi Arzucho. So the Medjus refers to it as the first test. Lech Lechomi Arzucho, go from your land. Nisoyin Achron, Lech Lecho El Harmario. The closing test, which was the Akedo, Lech Lechomi Harmario. Meaning the Ur Kazdim. Being thrown into the kiln, that was not a test. So over here in the footnote in the Midrash, Chaydasa Rambam. The Rambam, when he enumerates the test, the first test is Lech Lecho. The Urkazdim is not counted as one of the tests. Avolokain, he das Pirkei de Rebbe Lezer. He cites the Pirkei de Rebbe Lezer. Shesovedi Nusoni Rishon Hoya Shenechba Bamoro. Shloshes Rishono. He was actually, he was hiding. He was a fugitive for 13 years. He hid in a, he hid in a cave. Because he rejected paganism. He was thrown into the kiln. So, Lech Lech is the third test. But the, this Midrash holds, the, the first was Lech Lech Meyarzucho. What about the Orkazdim? Why is that a test? Why is that counted as a test? Evidently, it's not such a great accomplishment. We once explained that Avram Avinu was thrown into the kiln. Why, why was he thrown into the kiln? Because Avram, Medjah tells us a story, his father was an idol maker, an idol manufacturer. And Avram was asked to mine the store. His father comes back, every idol was smashed. So his father says to Avram, what happened? He says, I'll tell you what happened. The Somebody had brought a gift for one of the smaller idols, and the idol, small, the larger idol was upset, and all the idols start fighting for one another, and they each one smashed the other one to smithereens. That's why they were all broken and they're shattered. So Terach says to his Avram, "You talking to me? You know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not an imbecile. <laughs> How could this be? They're only stone and plaster. What do you mean they were fighting?" He says, "Father, listen to your own words." They're nothing. What do you believe in? His father became enraged. He took him to Nimrod, who was the king, and said, my son is a blasphemer. He has to, he deserves to be put to death. His own father brought him to be put to death. Nimrod says, you know, I'll give you a choice, an ultimatum. You bow, you live, you don't bow, you go into the kiln. Avram says, I'm going to the kiln. 
how could Lech Lecha be a test? He was in the cave for 13 years because he was a fugitive. The members of his community wanted to kill him. Torture him to death. Hashem says, you know, leave your land, leave your family, leave your countrymen, go to the land I will show you. There's no love lost between Avram and these people. These people despise him to his core. But why is that a test? But that's a test. That's a test. The orchasm was not a test. So what we'd explained in the past was that Avram Avinu had the ability to change people, lives. As it says, when he went to Canaan, he took all the souls that he made in Choron, he converted thousands and thousands of people to monotheism. And they all came with him. They came with him from Choron, they went to Canaan. As it says, Avram Agarius Anoshim, Vesar Magarius Anoshim. He converted the men, and Soro, Sorai converted the women. He had a tremendous charisma, power, genius impact on people. He held. Why did his father inform on him? Because his father is misinformed. But if he'd be able to spend some time with his father, with time, he'll, he'll teach his father the way, the, the correct belief. God says to Avram, and the Midrash says, it's hopeless. You're wasting your time. These people will never change. You know what it means? Avram believes that ultimately they will change. He could change them. Avram says, Hashem says you're at a dead end. It's beating a dead horse. No value whatsoever. You're going nowhere. What should have Avram said? And the measure says, what is it the equivalent of? If you take the, mo you take the most fragrant perfume and you open up the flask and you put it in a cemetery, is there anybody there who could benefit from the, from the fragrance of that special perfume? If you want people to benefit, he says you take it from the Beit HaMesim, bring it Beit HaChayim, bring it among the living, they could benefit. Choron is a Beis HaKvoros. It's, it's, it's a cemetery. These people have no capacity whatsoever to be affected. You're wasting your time. Go to the land I will show you. That's where you're going to succeed and you're going to thrive. What should have Avram said to Hashem? Give me one more try. One more try. Avram didn't say a word. Hashem says it's hopeless. Picked himself up. He left. Did not question. So it wasn't the question of doing or not doing. It's unswerving faith and trust. Hashem says that. I go. Hashem says bring your child who you love that was born to your old age as a sacrifice. He could have asked the question which was the Nisoyim which was the test but you promised me that the sun's the future. Stars of the heaven. Everything. Now you tell me to slaughter him. Avram didn't ask the question. Who am I to ask? He was totally negated. He suppressed the question. So every test we you go through it was a question, do you ask the question, don't you ask the question? It's not a question, do you do or don't you do? Going to Rakazdim, I will not bow, I'm going to die. It wasn't a question, it wasn't a belief issue. Therefore, that's the reason why that's not counted as one of the tests. The test is only within the context where you could have asked, and because you were so negated to Hashem, who am I to ask? That's the reason why it's not counted. Okay, and that's the Midrash. The first Nisoya and the first test was Lech Lecho. The closing test, Lech Lecho El Eretz Maria, for that reason. Pick the Rebbe says, no, a test is a test. Maybe a different dimension of test, different type of test. So therefore we start from the Ur Kazdim, and that's we count forward through the others for that reason.